Shalom Talmudim. Welcome once again to the 12 Minor Prophets. We are now in session 19 of our study of the prophets, and this is the book of Amos. We're, we're, we're working through the book of Amos. We're going to begin, we're going to be in the middle of chapter 5 as we pick up our session today. And we're working through material provided by REL Ministries. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at some of the concepts we talked about last session before we get into our new material. Uh, last session we saw that the northern kingdom of Israel is going to be uh, decimated by the Assyrians. It's going to be attacked. And the key worship centers, of, first of all, of Bethel. You can see Bethel here on the map just north of Jerusalem, just inside the territory of the northern kingdom. Bethel and the major the major worship center of idol worship, remember this is idol worship, and the uh, second major idol worship center, Gilgal, uh, to the east of Bethel. Both of these areas will be destroyed and uh, uh, decimated. Israel will suffer terribly. She will be like a firebrand. She will be like a stick full, pulled from the burning. And here, of course, we see a, a campfire and any one of those sticks are just on the verge of being turned into ashes. Well, you pull one out and blow the fire off, stick it in the water, and you've saved it. It's come just within a, a minuscule distance of being totally destroyed. And that's what uh, will happen with Israel. She will be like a brand uh, plucked from the fire. Almost, almost destroyed. But God never will destroy his people. Then we picked up the application chart. Uh, chapter 3 through the middle of chapter 5. And the theme I used for the application chart was God's cause and effect principle. The application in scripture that we saw lay in this comment. Because Israel had a special relationship with God, that's the cause God would punish them for their sins. They had a special relationship, and if we break that special relationship, if we do not honor it and do not responsibly adhere to it, then we're liable for punishment cause and effect relationship. But then we applied that to ourselves today. This cause and effect relationship does affect the believer today. As a believer today, we also have a special relationship with God through Jesus the Messiah, through the New Covenant. And the New Covenant is filled with commands. In fact, there's over 600 commands in the New Covenant. And if we deliberately sin, if we deliberately ignore those commands and rebel and put them behind our back, he will discipline us as well. Uh, just like with Israel, we're not going to lose our salvation. We're not going to lose our special covenant relationship through the, new, through the uh, new covenant with him, but we will be disciplined for our sins. And so I asked the question, do you sense that he's working in your life today in the area of, and here's some of the areas we have to work on, loving the world. It's so easy to love the world. The, the uh, northern kingdom loved the world. And uh, the Brit the HaDashah, the New Covenant, tells us don't love the world and the things of the world. What about playing church? You know, we go to our, we go to our uh, assemblies, but do we go there for Sunday morning entertainment? Do we do, go there just because we feel it's the, um, you know, the social thing to do? Or do we go there to grow, to learn God's word and then apply it to our lives and interact with our fellow believers. You know, we're not, we're, we're not to play at our assemblies. We're not to play at church. We're to take it seriously. Uh, the, um, the people in the Northern Kingdom did not take their relationship with God seriously. Compromising. What does God say about compromising? We're not to lead unruly lives. We're to lead disciplined, God-fearing, righteous lives and not compromise. And of course, the people in the Northern Kingdom were doing that. Well, we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing from our vantage point. Mistreating others. The people in the Northern Kingdom mistreated their brother and sisters in, uh, uh, brother and sister Jewish people. But we can do the same to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, so we aren't to mistreat others, especially if they're in the Lord with us. All right, so that brings us now to um, the next material. The first woe judgment in verses 18 through 27. Now at this point, Amos moves into the prophetic vantage point and he jumps to a different time frame. So let's review that prophetic vantage point quickly. Remember the prophetic, prevent, prophetic vantage point I liken to a traffic reporter in a helicopter. 
you know, the prophet is taken out of his normal space-time environment. He's like a traffic reporter flying over the freeway. And the freeway is the timeline. And so now Amos can look along the timeline. He can look at the past. He can look at the future. And he can know exactly what's going on. Now, as he looks down at the present, he sees Israel driving along the timeline. If he looks at the future, he sees there's a huge judgment awaiting Israel, just like a huge car accident up ahead. Now, Israel doesn't know what's ahead of them, but the prophet does. So what does Amos do at this point in time? He will now reveal to his contemporaries what's going to happen in the future. They can't see it, but he can. And now the prophet has revealed to uh, the, his contemporaries uh, what will happen if they keep going on down this road of sin. So they have a responsibility. How are they going to respond? Are they going to keep on going down the road and smash into the, um, smash into the uh, accident, the judgment up ahead? Are they going to stop? Are they going to turn off? How are they going to respond? Well, that's what's coming up in our next section here. So at this point in time, Amos has been in his present time, 760 BC, chapter 1 through chapter 5, verse 17. Now, in verse 18, he jumps far ahead, thousands of years ahead in the timeline. He scans his eye along the timeline, and he gives us a quick glimpse at the tribulation period in verses 18 through 20. Very quick glimpse. Now, the tribulation period is a very, very important period in the history of mankind and of Israel. It also goes by another very serious name. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, or as the NASB translates it here, the time of Jacob's distress. Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. This is going to be a unique time period, a unique day. It is the time of Jacob's distress. But notice the, the encouraging remor remark at the end. But he will be saved from it. Yes, this will be a terrible time for Israel, but Israel will survive. God will keep his promises. Okay, so that brings us now to verses 18 through 27 and the first woe judgment. Now the cause of the first woe judgment is brought out in verses 18 through 26. Two causes are going to be listed here. Cause number one is a desire, a desire for the day of the Lord, verses 18 through 20. Alas, woe. Many translations translate that Hebrew word woe, and it is the first woe judgment. That's where we get the name. Alas, woe to you who are longing for the day of the Lord. For what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not night. Verse 19. As when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or he goes home and he leans his hand against the wall and a snake bites him. Goes from the fire, frying pan into the fire, doesn't he? Verse 20. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? So the people of the northern kingdom we're living under a misconception, a misconception regarding the characteristics of the day of the Lord. And I guess that's understandable. Uh, only two previous prophets had written about the tribulation period. So this is an example of progressive revelation. You know, Obadiah writes about the tribulation period, and he characterized it as a time of punishment for the Gentiles. Well, that's true. That's true. But that's not the whole story. Now, Joel also writes about the tribulation period, and he characterizes it as a time of exaltation for Israel. True, but that's not the whole story. So, that is correct. It is a time of punishment for the Gentiles. It is a time of exaltation for Israel. But now Amos tells us some more information. It is also a day of judgment for Israel, and Israel will suffer during the time of Jacob's trouble, during the tribulation period. So the, the, the day will not be one of joy. The time period will not, not be exclusively one of joy. Judgment must precede the joy. And that's the new bit of information that Amos gives us now. Judgment will precede the joy. Judgment upon the Jewish people.
And uh, Joel shared that point. He shared it as a day of darkness in Joel chapter 2, verse 2. He's uh, consistent with Amos here. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it for the years of many gen generations. And so Joel and Amos both point out that the tribulation period is a unique experience in the history of mankind. He's not talking about just any run-of-the-mill you know, time period when he calls it the day of the Lord. He's talking about a very unique and serious time period, the most devastating time period in the history of mankind. All right, so that's the first cause for the first woe judgment, this desire for the day of the Lord. The second cause for this uh, first woe judgment is the fact that Israel's practicing false sacrifices. And here, here, Amos returns in verse 21 back to the present. So he's taught, told us about the tribulation period, that it's a time of joy and, well, I should say, of judgment and at the end, joy, judgment and joy for Israel. And after revealing that little bit of information, he now jumps back over thousands of years, back to his present time in 760 BC, and he deals with the pathetic present condition of the Northern Kingdom. And so their present condition is brought out in verses 21 through 23. Verse 21, God says, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of of your harps. So God is condemning what passed for worship in the northern kingdom, what passed for authorized worship. You see, all this, all the factors that God talked about in these last few verses are mentioned in the Mosaic law. Okay? But God is not denouncing the Mosaic sacrificial system here. He's not, he's not denouncing what he has revealed through the Mosaic law. What he's denouncing here is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, mere ritual with no substance behind it. Anyone can offer a sacrifice but without a heart of loving God. Any, a sinner, a, a sinner can offer a sacrifice, but if a sinner does, it will not be accepted. That's the idea. A righteous person offers a sacrifice for the, all, the reason, all the right reasons, because he loves God, and then God accepts it. So it's hypocrisy that is being condemned here. And the hypocrisy is detailed a little bit more in verse 24. Here is their present need. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. They need justice and righteousness. They need to practice those qualities in their lives. Because without justice and righteousness, worship is nothing but a sham. It's a fake. It's a pretense. You see, our relationship horizontally with our brothers and sisters must be right if it's going to be right vertically with God. So justice and righteousness, a, a practical out, outworking of our faith must be there. Something that comes from inside our souls, our desire to live for God and to live the way He wants us to live has to be there. Otherwise, just to offer sacrifices is hypocritical. It's a pretense. It's a fake worship. The fact that Israel has a history of hypocrisy is now brought out in verse 20, 25. Our past history of hypocrisy in the wilderness. Verse 25. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? And the answer is yes. We did offer sacrifices and grain offerings at the tabernacle. We had the tabernacle. He's referring back to the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And the tabernacle existed at the beginning of that, of that period. And once the tabernacle was finished, then we moved out for the promised land. But we sinned and we were required to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, what did we do in the wilderness? I mean, we had the, the mosaic system. We had the tabernacle. Well, 
we followed the Mosaic system, but we sacrificed to idols as well. It was a synchronistic worship, worship of the Lord and worship of idols. And uh, that God will not accept. And the fact that we did this kind of activity is mentioned in a number of books in the Bible. For example, Joshua 24, 14. Joshua is saying, just as the, the people are ready to enter the promised land, he says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him, what? In sincerity and truth, not in insincerity and hypocrisy. Serve him in sincerity and truth. How? Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river. That's the ancient gods uh, that um, Abraham's forefathers served. Uh, and beyond the river is a reference to the Euphrates. So put away the gods which your father served beyond the river, which your descendants before Abraham served. And the, and the gods which your father served in Egypt. Now this is more recent. And serve the Lord. See the, um, the uh, progenitors of this particular generation also served the Egyptian gods. So Joshua says, get away, put away that stuff. In Nehemiah 9, 918, this whole history of hypocrisy is mentioned as well. And uh, verse 18 reads, Even when they made for themselves a calf of molten metal and said, This is your God who brought you up from Egypt and committed great blasphemies. So he's referring to the worship of the golden calf. You know, it didn't take Israel very long. And, and as soon as Moses disappeared in the glory cloud up on Mount Sinai and we're down on the base of the, on the mountain, and we're worshiping a golden idol, a golden statue that has no power. And God will not stand for that kind of thing. In Ezekiel 20, verses 6 through 8, God says, On that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the land. So there's the promise. The promised land laid out to the Jewish people, I'm going to bring you to a wonderful, wonderful territory that you'll own. So he said, I said to them, here's, here's one of the conditions for entering that land. Cast away, each of you, the detestable things from his eyes. Do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. See, these idols are not your gods. This is just useless idols. I am the Lord your God. This is the living God speaking to, speaking to you the true and living God, Re the response, but they rebelled against me and they were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. And you know, uh, Egyptologists tell us, some tell us that the Egyptians had upwards to 2,000 gods, 2,000 gods and goddesses and idols. Well, some, some disagree with that, but most will agree that the Egyptians had at least hundreds, hundreds of gods and goddesses and idols. And here's a sample of just three of them. This is, this is Thoth, the god of writing and science. Now the Israelis were literate. Maybe they worshipped him. I wonder what Moses did as he was being trained in Pharaoh's court when he came face to face with this kind of stuff. Be nice to talk with him. Maybe we'll be able to talk with him in the kingdom and ask what it was like. So this is Thoth, the god of writing and science. And this cute little falcon here, he's Horus, the god of the sky. The god of the sky. And uh, my third one is Ra. Ra, the god of the sun, the sun god. So these are some of the idols that the Jewish people very well could have worshipped in Egypt. That was part of our hypocrisy. So not only did we worship the, the gods of Egypt, but we worship the Assyrian Babylonian star god in verse 26. You also carried along Sikut, your king, and Kiyun, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Now this word uh, Sikut means tabernacle. The name of this god in Babylonia is Adarmelek. Kiyum means shrine. The Babylonian name for this so-called god is Kimano, Kaimanu. The Roman name for this god is Saturn. So they sacrificed to this idol as well, this, uh, this star god or something like that. Who knows exactly what it was, but 
it was idol worship, and God will not be pa- is only so patient with that. He only he only goes so far with that stuff. So in the past, as well as in the present, Israel had been disloyal to the Lord. Disloyalty, disloyalty to the covenant, will bring on the curses of the covenant. Remember Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. And so now, as we turn to verse 27, that judgment is explained. The judgment is explained. Verse 27. Therefore, I will make take I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So the judgment will include exile, captivity, and exile out of the land. This, by the way, is the most severe curse of the covenant. As uh, Israel disobeys, the curses of the covenant start out mild, but they get more and more and more severe as Israel continues to reject the discipline. Finally, captivity and exile is the most severe curse of the covenant. And they will be exiled beyond Damascus, beyond Syria, into the very guts of the Assyrian kingdom. And this will be completed in 722 BC. So here is a map of the Assyrian kingdom, the Assyrian empire, I should say. Uh, You can see Judah and Israel, uh, and uh, Judah with Israel to the north and Syria to the north of Israel, and Damascus is the capital of Syria. But they won't be exiled in the general area. No, they won't be exiled regionally. They will be exiled clear into the bowels of the Assyrian empire, far, far away from the promised land. And that was the Assyrian policy. The Assyrian policy was to uh, exile and deport the peoples that they had conquered. And so they followed this policy, of course, with the Northern Kingdom as well. That brings us to chapter six. We now move into chapter six and the second woe judgment in verses one through 14. Now the cause of the second woe judgment is brought out in verses one through six, and we have two causes. First of all, false security in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. They are trusting in the security of Samaria, verse 1. Woe to those, this is why we call it the woe judgment. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost of nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Now the city of Samaria was perched on the top of the hill of Shemer. It was a fairly steep hill. and The city of Samaria could only be attacked with an uphill attack. So that was a disadvantage for the attacking uh, army to have to try to trudge uphill. So they had high walls and they possessed a much confidence in their very, very strong defenses. And without a doubt, they had good defenses. But the problem is they're not trusting in God. They're trusting in stone walls. And, you know, stone walls are no, no um, guaranteed form of security. Only trusting in the Lord. That's your only guaranteed form of security. And this is what God points out in verse 2. Verse 2. Go over to Kalne and look. Go over there to Hamat the Great. Then go down to Gath with the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? Or is their ter- territory greater than yours? So greater cities than Samaria have fallen to the Assyrians. Three cities are mentioned. Three bigger, better defended cities have already fallen to the Assyrians. What makes you think, Samaria, that you're immune to this judgment? So their confidence is in the wrong place, in their army and in their defenses, their walls. So they have a false security. The second reason for the woe judgment is luxurious living in verses three through six. Do you put off the day of calamity and would you bring near the seat of violence? Verse four, those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. They have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. I'd like to share at this point the comments by the Bible Knowledge Commentary 
I think this, this commentary shares some very accurate and clear remarks regarding verses 3 through 6. So I'll let them do the talking right now. I'll let them do the teaching. Bible Knowledge Commentary. The, the commentator writes, Rather than heed the prophet's warnings of judgment, the leaders of Samaria instead gave themselves to what? To a decadent hedonism. There it is, luxurious living. They reclined on expensive beds whose wood was inlaid with ivory. At their opulent feasts, they lounged on their couches. The Hebrew word for lounge, sarach, conveys a sprawled stupor of satiation and drunkenness with arms and legs hanging over the side of the, of the couch of the bed. You know, just pretty, a pretty um, ugly scene there. They ate gourmet food, choice lambs and fatted calves, the tastiest and tenderest meat they could get. In their drunken revelry, they imagined this, themselves strumming like David as they attempted to improvise music at their parties. Yet they were vastly different from David. Not content to drink wine from goblets, they consumed it by the bowlful. Only the finest lotions would do for their skin. Their sole concern was for their own luxurious lifestyle. They did not grieve over the coming ruin of Joseph, the northern kingdom. They had no concern for their nation's impending doom. Good comments. Good comments that accurately explain verses 3 through 6. And so the judgment is going to come. It will consist of five elements. The judgment will be explained in verses 7 through 14. So the first element, the first element that it consists of is the captivity in verse 7. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles with the sprawlers banqueting will pass away. Now, here is, this is an explanation of verses 3 through 6, the results of, of uh, verses 3 through 6. And you know, sometimes, sometimes archaeology really illuminates very, very clearly what's going on. So at this point, I'd also like to share with you some comments from Biblical Archaeology Review. This, these comments, this article has been reproduced for you on page 10 of your Amos handouts. It refers to the Marzeach, the pagan religious banquet that's being described here. And when you read the, read the word sprawlers, it refers to the lewd behavior and the drunken stupor, the dissipation that the, um, that the, uh, that the revelers uh, displayed as they were sprawling across their beds. But the, uh, the Barr article will illustrate this nicely with an archaeological find. So here's the comments from a Biblical Archaeology Review. The Marzeach Amos denounces is the full article in your, in your uh, handout. In this graphic description of the Marzeach, Amos gives prominence to beds of ivory. Couches decorated with ivory inlays where guests sprawled during the festivities. An excellent example of such furniture is an ivory bed from the 8th century BC uncovered in the cemetery at Salamis in Cyprus. So here we have an archaeological attestation to this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, description. Ancient ivories thus provide a vivid illustration of the beds of ivory that Amos abhorred. Mentioned in verse 7 there. Now here's a picture that accompanied the article. This is one of those beds of ivory. Uh, probably wooden beds, but inlaid with the beautiful ivory decorations that made them extremely expensive. So these were luxury items. Fully in accord with the fact that uh, the, the inhabitants of the Northern Kingdom were involved in a decadent lifestyle. All they cared about was their own luxurious lifestyle. So the judgment will consist, number one, of the captivity and exile. Secondly, it will consist of the destruction of the city of Samaria in verse 8. The Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all that it contains. So Samaria, 
who is so confident of their defenses is going to go down. And when the city goes down, the entire northern kingdom will be going down too, and the population will be decimated in verse 11. And it will be if ten men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry, his, carry out his bones from the house, and they will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house, Is anyone else with you? That one will say, No, no one. Then he will answer, Keep quiet, keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. So in verses 9 through 11, the population will be decimated. Only one-tenth of the population will be left. And the ones that are left will not mention the name of the Lord. The few survivors will be, live in dread. They will be afraid to pray. They will be afraid to utter God's name. That might come to his attention. He might turn around and destroy them. So they were living in terror of the Lord because he had brought this judgment upon them. And the sad point is, the sad thing is, lies in the fact that this is true for Israel today. Today, the ultra-Orthodox community and most Jews are afraid and unwilling to utter God's personal name. So we use substitutes. We use substitutes like the Lord or Hashem, something like that. Why are we afraid to write out even or to pronounce God's uh, personal name? because we're afraid we'll take his name in vain, that will upset him, and he will send us out on another diaspora. They're afraid we'll break the law and be punished by it. So what, what happened in the Northern Kingdom way back in Amos' day uh, is hap will happen again, is happening again today. We're afraid and unwilling to honor God's personal name. Well, now the moral comes in verses 12 and 13. Uh, Amos is going to ask some rhetorical questions. These are unnatural events, verses 12 and 13. Do horses run on rocks? Of course not, rhetorical question. Or does one plow, with, plow them with oxen? Of course not, you don't plow rocks with oxen. This is unusual and, and um, unnatural. And then God turns to Israel. Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. See, just as it is unnatural to plow rocks or to run on rocks, so Israel has done the unnatural and the unimaginable. We have rebelled against the Lord. We've rebelled against the living God. And we've shaken our fist on him, at him. So as our behavior is unnatural and unimaginable, it is also unimaginable for sin to go unpunished. So Israel's sins will be punished. Now in verse 13, God, um, God uh, deals with their boast. They've been boasting. You know, this is a time of prosperity and conquest for the northern kingdom. And here's what they were doing. You who rejoice in Lodibar and say, have we not by our own strength taken Karnaim for ourselves? See, verse 13 is a boast. You know, we're strong. We've taken these cities of Lodabar and Karnaim. These are conquered cities. But God has chosen the names of these cities to make a point. Lodabar means nothing. Karnaim means horns, which speaks of the strength of the, of the animal. It's also a, a kind of a word for strength. So God is saying, you're rejoicing in nothing. You have no strength. I am going to bring judgment upon you. So just as it is unnatural for sin to go unpunished, God will not be unnatural. He will do the correct and natural thing. He will punish Israel's sins. And so far, and so the whole land will be desolated in verse 14. For behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamat to the brook of the Arabah. The point here is that from north, Hamat, to the south, the Arabah, the whole land will be desolated. Now here is a map of the Assyrian Empire, 
And here was a close-up of the western arm of the Assyrian Empire. And you can see Judah, and to the north of Judah is Israel, and to the north of Israel is Syria, and to the north of Syria lays Hamat. There's Hamat at the very top of the western arm. So Hamat in the north, from Hamat in the north to way down south to the Arabah. The Arabah is the valley between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Eilat. So from north to south, from Hamat to the Arabah, the land will be desolated. And of course you can see on this map, the yellow is the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrian Empire. And so Assyria did conquer the whole area of Judah from north to south, and much more of course as well. Here's a more detailed map of the Arabah. The, you can see the southern part of the Arabah is the Gulf of Eilat. And then the valley slopes downward to the north, to the, and up at the northern end is the Dead Sea. So the valley slopes downward to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth. So this is the Arabah, the Arabah, the valley that he's talking about. Let's take a look at that. Here's a picture of the Arabah. And as you can see, it is a valley. You can see hills on both sides. And you can see that it's a very desolate and dry area of the world and irrigation allows it to be productive. Here we, I think this is probably a, a date palm orchard that is being nourished by, by um, drip irrigation, by Israeli drip irrigation. But I think it's a date palm orchard. Here's another view of the Arabah. This time the photographer is up on the hills looking down into the valley as it makes its way south, as it makes its way north downward toward the Dead Sea. And finally, this is sunset at the Arabah. So the photographer is standing on the west side looking east and you can see the shadow from the sun and the sun illuminating the, the uh, eastern hills that uh, form the sides of the Arabah. So that's the valley that God's talking about there. Now here, this is a map of Israel after the fall of the Northern Kingdom in 722 BC. And of course you notice on the map that everything is colored gold. Everything is colored gold. Well everything that's gold or brown colored there means that it is under the domination of the Assyrians. Everything in gold is under the domination of the Assyrians. One area is not. Look at that. One little area has not fallen under their total and complete control and domination, and that's the heartland of Judah. Judah will survive. Judah will continue. The Assyrians will be defeated by the Babylonians. And then in 586, Judah's sins will, be, will step over the line that God has drawn in the, sound, in the sand. And in 586, that's finally when the southern kingdom will be sent into exile. But for right now, God is preserving it, and it is keeping it intact, even though Assyria is dominating the entire area. All right, well, this brings us to the third major section of Amos, the visions of Amos from chapter 7, verse 1 to chapter 9, verse 15. So we begin with some visions. First of all, the vision of the locusts in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. So the plague of locusts is described in chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Let's take a look at this locust plague. Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing. And it came about when it was finished eating the vegetation of the land that I said, and we'll stop right there. So he, in a vision, he sees a locust plague that comes after the king's mowings, but before the latter growth, the spring growth. There's a, just a little time frame in there. Now, the king's mowing was tribute. The king's mowing was the crops that were taken first. They were a tax to support the king. He wanted his share, and he wanted it first. And then there was the spring growth. And the spring growth, or the latter growth, depending on how your translation renders it, the spring growth was for the people in general, population in general. The problem here is they will get none of it. The royal house will have an abundance, but then the locust plague will come and the people will lose everything and they'll be starving. And so this 
this plague would be, would mean total destruction of the northern kingdom. So if this judgment comes as Amos sees it, it would be an absolute, total, 100% disaster upon the northern kingdom. So Amos sees that and he intercedes for the northern kingdom in verse 2. He says, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand? He is so small, for he is small. So the plague is going to be averted by the prophet's prayer. And note his personal concern and loyalty to the northern kingdom. I mean, he's from the southern kingdom, which is uh, uh, operating in rivalry with the northern kingdom. But he doesn't have a bitterness or or a desire to see the northern kingdom destroyed. He's concerned and loyal about his Jewish brothers and sisters. So he intercedes to avert the plague, and the judgment is averted in 7, 3, chapter 7, verse 3. The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Now notice how Amos's long and eloquent prayer was effective, wasn't it? No, it was really it was a short, basic, straightforward prayer, wasn't it? but it was in line with God's will, and so God responds. See, our prayers don't have to be eloquent and long-winded and use all kinds of, you know, spiritual language. You know, when we pray, we should just talk with God from our heart, just as Amos did here. You know, oh Lord, please, you know, how can Israel stand? How can, how can the Jewish people stand? They're so weak. See? A very simple prayer. Now this verse, which says God changed his mind, does not contradict God's character. God is not fickle, implicit in every warning, and this is a warning, is the expectation of mercy for a correct response. And so this warning, this vision is given to Amos and he responds correctly. His, respond, his response, his prayer is in line with the will of God. And so God responds to his prayer. Well, then comes another vision, the vision of the flaming fire in verses 4 through 6. It's a plague of drought, verse 4. Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire, and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. So this is a plague of drought that is so bad, it's supernatural, and it is so bad and so intense that it would have dried up the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, that would have totally desolated the land and there would be no one left. Israel would be totally destroyed. And so what does Amos do? He intercedes again in verse 5 with another long and eloquent and spiritual prayer. Then I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand for you small? You know, notice his current concern for Jacob. Notice the simplicity of the prayer. You know, just pray, folks. Don't worry about... about um, getting a million people on Facebook to pray with you and uh, writing out a long eloquent prayer thinking God will hear. God will hear no matter who prays as long as the prayer is in line with his will. So don't make a mistake in that area. Anyone can pray from the young to the old and if, you're, if your personality leads you to pray long, pray long eloquent prayers that's fine. And if your personality uh, is for very short, simple prayers like Amos, this shepherd, this farmer. You know, he wasn't into long, eloquent, rhetorical expressions. You know, God will hear as long as the prayer is in line with his will. So Amos prays again, and the judgment is averted in chapter 7, verse 6. The Lord changed his mind and said, This too shall not, shall not be, said the Lord God. So for the second time, the, a plague is averted. Now again, what's this idea about God changing his mind? Well, I think a better translation of this verse would be God relented. God relented of his threatened course of judgment. So that would be a better translation than the word repent or changed his mind. That sounds kind of like God had only one option and then he said, okay, I'll, I'll go another direction. But the word relented is a little different. The word relented does not mean that God changed his mind. It means that he embarked on another course of action. He embarked on a better option. You see, um, the Hebrew word naham suggests relief or comfort from a planned, 
undesirable course of action. Okay, God is showing to Amos the most severe option possible, but that's not the only option possible. You know, judgment will come, but it doesn't have to be the most severe one. You know, God is not inflexible. He responds to individuals' needs and attitudes and actions. So he's responding to Amos here. Now, the nation was not forgiven. Judgment would come. But this particular judgment, this judgment of a, a flaming fire, this, this drought that would have destroyed the entire nation and all the people, will not come. That's the worst option possible. So this particular punishment was withdrawn. Now Amos, notice, Amos did not ask for forgiveness again. Okay, he did not ask for forgiveness again. For some judgment on Israel was inevitable. It's going to come. But by his prayers, he was able to affect what form that judgment would take. So remember, prayer is an integral part of God's will. And we should be praying. And God will respond to our prayers as long as they're in line with his will. And so never forget that lesson from Amos. But remember, there is a limit. There always comes a limit. Whether for us or for the northern kingdom, there is a limit to God's mercy and patience. And when we keep rebelling and keep rebelling and keep rebelling, eventually discipline or judgment will come. And uh, the, that fact is brought out in the vision, vision of the plumb line in verses 7 through 9. This happens to be a personal message to the prophet. And the basic message here is, Amos, pray no more. So the vision is in verse 7. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. Now, a plumb line checks the physical alignment of the wall. You know, the straightness of the wall. The wall has to be vertical. If it's leaning one way or the other, it's eventually going to fall down. And uh, here's a picture of a man doing exactly what Amos describes. He's building this wall or this pillar. Maybe it's part of a wall. But he's checking its straightness with a plumb line. Plumb line is just a cord with a heavy weight at the bottom. And, of course, it will hang vertical. And when it does, you can compare whether your wall is parallel to that plumb line, whether it is vertical as well. And you want it to be straight. You want it to be up and down so that it won't titter and totter off in one direction or the other. And so this plumb line, which checks the physical alignment of a wall, is uh, symbolic of a spiritual plumb line. A spiritual plumb line, uh, God's standard of righteousness, will now check the moral straightness of Israel. See, righteousness means to live by a standard of behavior. And so God's moral plumb line is going to be uh, let down in the midst of Israel, and the moral straightness of Israel is going to be seen very clearly. Is it parallel with the plumb line, or is it leaning in one direction or another? So the interpretation of the vision comes in verse 8. The Lord said to me, What do you see, Amos? And I said, A plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. So the plumb line shows the crookedness of the northern kingdom. Israel is out of spiritual alignment. They're leaning. They're not vertical. They're not lined up with God's standard of righteousness, straight up and down. And so this time judgment will not be averted. Amos's prayer would do no good from this point on. Two plagues have been averted, but no more. It's time for judgment to come. The line has been crossed, and so the judgment is stated in verse 9. Three results of this judgment. Verse 9. The high places of Isaac will be desolated, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be laid waste, and then I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So, First result, the high places will be desolate. The high places were the location of informal idolatry. The people would build, uh, 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 what do you call it, altars on the, on the hilltops. Worship centers would be, uh, would be made on the high hills, and they would offer their idol worship on the hills, the high places. So those informal areas of, of idol worship will be desolate. 
Secondly, the sanctuaries of Israel are going to be laid waste because of their improper sacrifices. And this means the, the um, altars at Gilgal and Bethel. These were formal places of worship, but they were not places of true worship of the Lord. So the high places, the informal places of worship, desolate, the formal sanctuaries of Israel, of Israel laid waste, and then the house of Jeroboam will be destroyed. That's because the royal family were primarily responsible for the state of the nation. They were the leaders of the nation. And when they went into idolatry, the nation followed. And now we come to a little historical interlude that is inserted here. It's the conflict with Amaziah in chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. And this conflict shows us very graphically Israel's crookedness and the fact that God's impending judgment is correct and right. So we start with the accusation of Amaziah in verses 10 through 13, and Amaziah's words are directed at two men. First of all, it's directed at Jeroboam in verses 10 and 11. A mixture of truth and error is going to be related to the king. So let's start with verse 10. By the way, here is the, this is the map of the formal worship centers of Gilgal and Bethel. Those were the formal worship centers. Okay, verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. First bit of information, Amos has conspired against you. That is false. Amos was doing no underhanded conspiracy. So he's calling Amos a traitor. Amos is a, is a traitor, he's a public menace, he's a rabble-rouser, he's a nuisance, he's a conspirator. Secondly, verse, and verse 10, the land is unable to endure all his words. The land can't bear his message, and that is true. The first statement was false. This statement is true because his words are too disturbing to be tolerated. This conspirator's words are too, too disturbing. Well, that part was true, that they were disturbing words. And so the indictment comes in verse 11. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Amaziah accuses Amos of saying that Jeroboam will be killed. Well, that's false. The dynasty would end, but Jeroboam would not be killed. So that was false. He also says that Amos said Israel go into captivity. Well, that part is true. That part is true. So this message of Amaziah to Jeroboam has its, has its little twist to it to make Jer uh, Amos seem especially uh, despicable. So that's his words to the king Jeroboam. Now Amaziah turns to Amos and in verses 12 and 13 he makes some comments. First of all in verse 12 he insults Amos. Then Amaziah said to Amos, go you seer. He's insulting Amos here. He's showing his feelings about Amos by giving him a lesser title. You're not a prophet, you're just a seer. And then in the second part of verse 12 he accuses Amos of doing it for money. Flee away to the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and there do your prophesying. You know, that the, ac the accusation is, make your living elsewhere, you money-hungry phony. Go somewhere else and, and uh, conspire against the king and make your money. And, thir and in verse 13, Amaziah tells him not to continue to prophesy at Bethel. But no longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is a sanctuary of the king. It is a royal residence. You know, this is, uh, this is highfalutin ground here. This is where the king uh, lives. This is where the king worships. You don't belong here, you inferior rebel. Well, Amos has an answer to this conversation, these accusations by Amaziah, verses 14 through 17. He explains his call to the prophetic office in verses 14 and 15. So he begins by stating his occupation in verse 14. Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet. I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. Well, when he says he's not a prophet, he means he's not a professional prophet. Of course he's a prophet. God has told him to, pro to prophesy. What he's saying here, he's not a professional. He doesn't do this for the money. He's also not one of the sons of the prophets. He's not a member of the prophetic guild. Okay? He's not trained as a prophet. 
he is actually totally out of his element because he's a herdsman. He's a shepherd. He was trained to raise sheep, not to prophesy. He's also a farmer. He's a dresser of sycamore trees. You know, the sycamore fruit is a small fig, uh, a small fig-like fruit, but it's not edible until it's bruised or slit to enable ripening. It's what was called the poor man's fig. Now here's a picture of a sycamore fig tree. Notice how huge that tree is. Can you see the guys in the little yellow circle at the bottom of the picture, those tiny little guys? Well, they're a lot closer to us than that fig tree is. That f sycamore fig is huge. And here is a cluster of sycamore figs. They needed to be bruised. They needed to be sliced before they would ripen. And so that's what Amos did. He probably, um, whatever, they, whatever the normal procedure was, he made sure these uh, figs ripened so that he could sell them. So that was his occupation, a shepherd and a farmer. Then he explains his call in verse 15. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. So his office of prophet came by prophetic revelation. He was commanded personally to preach in Israel. But Amos was obedient. Amos was obedient to what he was commanded to do in contrast to Israel who was not obedient. And now in verses 16 and 17, we were going to come to the authentication of the prophet. You know, the prophet couldn't just, you couldn't just walk into somebody's presence and say, I am a prophet. You had to be verified. The prophet must utter a near prophecy that comes to pass exactly as predicted. That's the first step of uh, prophetic verification. And so he begins by dealing with the sin of Amaziah in verse 16. Now hear the word of the Lord. You are saying, you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. So the sin of Amaziah is forbidding Amos to preach. But Amos ignores him and obeys God rather than man. And what Amaziah is doing is fulfilling Amos 2.12. He's forbidding genuine prophecy, Amos 2.12. But you made the Nazarites drink wine, and you commanded the prophet, saying, You shall not prophesy. So he's doing exactly uh, what was, what was uh, being stated in Amos 2.12. And so the judgments, the judgments are set against Amaziah. Five judgments. Will these judgments come true? Five judgments against Amaziah. Verse 17. Therefore, says the Lord, your, wa your wife will become a harlot in the city, your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be parceled up by a measuring line. And you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. So there are five judgments against Amaziah. First of all, against his wife. His wife will become a prostitute. Secondly, against his children. His children will be killed. So the first Two judgments come against his family. Thirdly, his land will be divided as spoil. The third judgment comes against his possessions, and I'm sure he had many. I'm sure he lived in, in hedonistic luxury. Fourthly, the judgment comes against his life. He will die in exile. And fifthly, the judgment comes against his captivity against, against his country. His country will go into captivity. Five judgments against his wife, against his children, against his possessions, against his very life, and against his country. So Amos has just personally experienced why judgment must come. The nation is in rebellion. They are refusing to allow the true prophets to bring the word of God. This is why judgment would come and it will not be alleviated. But Amos has just put his prophetic credentials on the line. Is he a prophet or isn't he? Will these five judgments come to pass? Well, the five judgments did. And that verified Amos. And then his book was added to the canon of Scripture. His book was added to the canon of Scripture. All right, well, this brings us to a good uh, closing point. We've run out of time for this session. Next week, next week, next session, uh, I want to start by explaining this test of a prophet that Amos has just entered into. What exactly was the test of a prophet? 
and what did it, uh, how, was, how was Israel guided, and how, would that, how does that affect us today? We'll pick that up next session when we continue in our study through the book of Amos. Thanks for being part of this session. Shalom.